construction industry. He joined Ironrod Erin in 2011, having previously worked for a number of consultancies as a structural design engineer. Nell initially worked in the track and structures technical section in the Western Division, specialising in inspection and maintenance of structural and track assets, engineering appraisals and value engineering to ensure the most cost effective use of budgets, asset management with infrastructure, within infrastructure, as well as standards development and compliance. In 2020, Nell joined the Cork Line Rehabilitation Project as a technical lead on the project, where he has worked on various new technologies and initiatives with regard to track construction, which will be discussed in the presentation. I believe we've started recording, looks OK. So um, this evening's presentation is titled Dublin to Cork uh, Upgrade or Rehabilitation Project. Sorry, it's a late change from now there. <laughs> um, so I'll pass you on to now whenever you're ready now. Uh, thanks very much. So, so I'll start. So um, the presentation is it's the Dublin to Cork uh, line rehabilitation project. But uh, for the rest of the presentation, I'll be calling it the Cork line rehabilitation project because um, because all the lines pretty much start in Dublin um, it, with their names come after where, where they end. So we've the Cork line, the Belfast line, the Galway line, etc. So the Cork line rehabilitation project or CLRP for short. I'm the senior track and structures engineer and PSDP coordinator on the project. So I'm, I'm the technical lead. So what I'll be discussing today is an overview of the, the Cork Line Rehabilitation Project, a little bit on the track structure, then I'll be going into our OTM ballast cleaning, uh, survey design and implementation, and then the two types of relaying we do, which is panel relay and gantry lane, and then finally I'll end on the productivity and quality achieved over the course of the project so far. So a bit on the on the overview of the, the CLRP. So um, uh, Dublin to Cork would be our, our, our premier line um, in Ireland. It's the it's the line between our two major cities, so it's Dublin to Cork. Um, in 2019, it was apparent that the, the route was approaching the end of its natural life. So at that stage, 62% of the rail was greater than 30 years old. Approximately 370,000 sleepers were approaching the end of their lives. So we had multiple crack sleepers and failed ends and that type of um, defect. It was subject to over 6.1 million tonnes of traffic per year. And at that time, significant expenditure was was being spent on localised repairs. So we were and we were replacing defects um, ad hoc, really a lot of localised repairs. So it ended up we were putting more wells into the track, which is not ideal. And at that stage, it was decided a more efficient and cost effective approach would be to take the renewal of the whole project, uh, the whole line as a as a single renewal project. So forecasted at that time from 2019 to 2026, it's a 250 million euro project. Uh, the plan is to renew 220 miles of track and renew and refurbish PNC layouts along the route. So at this stage, there's probably about um, 160 miles left and about over uh, about 25 PNC units, but there could be more as we go along. <coughs> so some basics here. So I initially I gave this presentation at Two Engineers Ireland um, in um, in Ireland. So um, it was a, an, an audience that was wider than when just inside the railway. So there's a couple of slides here that everyone probably knows, but I said it's it's no harm to kind of to go over them anyway. So just on the track structure. So the track construction is made up of the rail, rail pads and fastening sleepers and the ballast bed. And the main task of the components is to dissipate forces generated by the traffic to the subgrade. Um, so obviously the rail and sleepers deteriorate over time due to traffic loading and environmental conditions. And we also get de degradation of the ballast, um, which caused the, the ballast bed to, to become fouled. Um, so uh, I, it's more than just re repairing what you can see, or replacing what you can see in terms of the, the rails, the rails and the, the sleepers. The ballast is just as important. And we're also looking for the right mix in terms of um, stiffness. So it's, it's not be too stiff to cause excessive wear on the track components and not be too soft to, to cause um, an adverse effect on the geometry and holding geometry. Um, so for category one lines in Ireland, we require 300 mil minimum ballast um, under the sleeper and the Cork to Dublin line is a category one line. Again, a quite a simple slide here, but it is it is we have a wider gauge, so, so the terms could be different. So what we call the space between the two rails is called the five foot. And then the space between the tracks is called uh, the six foot. Uh, then from the outer rail out to the, the boundary line or the fence is we call the cess. And then in four track situations, you have a 10 foot between the double lines. 
so the, the the approach that we went with was first that we had to renew the, the ballast bed. Um, mm -hmm. So for a number of years now, we've had, uh, we I think it was 2011, 2012, we purchased um, an OTM ballast cleaner. So it's OTM 781. And this works ahead of the cleaning um, and renews the ballast bed so that when we when we come back to do the relay and then it's just a skim dig because we have the full depth of ballast um, because we've already cleaned with the ballast cleaner. So then to just go how the ballast cleaner works. Um, so the first thing is we excavate a launch pit. So the picture on the left hand side there, you can see the launch pit's been dug out. Then the ballast cleaner is positioned so that the, the cutting bar can be installed in the launch pit. So the second picture there, the middle picture, you can see the guys, they're setting up the excavator chain. And the third picture there, you see the excavator chain ready and that, that's ready to go. The ballast cleaning process. So the ballast cleaner, what it does is this, it screens the ballast and removes all, the, all um, any contaminants and small particles. Um, we're able to return good ballast behind the cutting chain. So in the first picture there, you can see the the, the good the return, the, the good ballast being put back into the track. Um, and then the, the spoil, the, 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 what, what we've taken out, this has to be removed and this goes removed through the spoil chute. So as part of the work, we need to manage the spoil output. So in the picture there on the right hand side, you see it's been side cast directly onto the into the cess, which will be come back and cleaned away after. In some cases where we might never room to to um, to cast onto the embankment, we bring along dumpers so the spoil chute can be maneuvered as you need to um, so it can go. It can actually go out ahead of the of the train and uh, the spoil can be removed directly into dumpers. So the main benefits of um, of OTM ballast cleaning. Obviously, a big thing is that we can renew the ballast bed without the need to um, remove the, the, the rails and the sleepers. So we're, we're not actually cutting any rails and all that associated the work that we'd have to do um, to do that. Uh, renew the ballast bed over four meter width. Uh, the clean and also puts a one in 25 crossfall on the formation to allow for the ballast bed to freely drain. So in, so in association with this works, we're doing a lot of um, drainage work. So we're putting in drainage pipes along with the ballast clean and so that we have, uh, we can maintain the permeability of the, um, of, of the bed going forward, which is obviously hugely important. Um, another big thing, it's it reduces the amount of rail workers on the track. So in the past, we would have had a group of men out digging muggy box, mucky boxes and that type of repair. Um, in this case, we 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 boot soft ground, so it's it, it's inherently safer. Um, we've also looked at the in in Dublin to Cork, which is is double line. Um, we were able to keep the adjacent line open. Um, so this is we started doing single line work, and in the last couple of years, so that's we've a ballast cleaner on um, on one road. Uh, the other road is kept open at um, uh, under a speed restriction. Um, so at that state, they were able to we we're able to do longer possessions, so we're able to get more work done. And because we're not cutting the rail, we're able to hand the track back at higher speeds. Um, so we have a standard TSR of 25 miles an hour for all this type of work. And the ballast cleaner is um, at the moment, the, the sites are being handed back at 40 miles an hour. So obviously there's a lot more work that goes into than just when the ballast cleaner is out doing its work. So just to lay out, we'd say the, 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 the process. So in week one, then we were cutting an embankment prep. Um, obviously, if we are um, uh, leaving sp spoil on embankments, um, we need to make sure they're prepared. We'll do checks to make sure they're not high risk, that there's not a, any additional risk by, by, by pouring the spoil on the embankments, those type of things. Uh, we do depth checks at bridges and signals, so we, we make sure that there's no foundations that could come within the within the envelope of the of the ballast cleaner. Um, we do depth checks about every 50 meters. Um, it's not ideal. Uh, we still do find that we could find you know, old sleepers and old um, benchmarks, um, um, illegal um, pipes being put under the track, um, things like that. So we are looking at looking at GPR methods that we can get a better idea of what's coming up because it can be it can be hard work when you're uh, you're out in a limited time in a ballast cleaner shift and you're you're coming across these unforeseen issues. Um, week two, then we do our pre-stress and we mark the site up. So we mark the site up at 10 meter changes as we take our six foots, uh, we take our dips and from there we manage our designs. Uh, we take all our bridge, clear, bridge clearances to, to make sure that we, when we leave the, when the track goes back into to the design level that we're not impinging on any clearances. Uh, we do our pre-survey with our Guido trolleys, which I, I'll, I'll go through later on. 
week three then so on this on the weekend of week three uh we do our ballast cleaning um we do uh ballast clean we uh ballast up immediately after the ballast cleaner because obviously we are taking away a certain percentage of um spoil material uh so if we didn't put ballast back it would just end up being a hole in the ground uh we have our tampon which runs directly after our ballasting and then the, there's a TSR that goes on prior to prior to the uh, tra being open to traffic the next day. The following week, then we have our Hobbs train. So our Hobbs train is a high output um, ballast system. So it's it's um, it, it, it can provide, I think it's 700, 375 tons of ballast, um, which is needed obviously because the, the the ballast cleaner has removed so much. Uh, we do design tamps. Then we have our site tidy. We have ORV sweeping. And then um, at the end of that week, we return to line speed at 40, uh, um, return to line speed. So the cork line is mostly 100 miles an hour. Uh, week five then just tidy up work. So we have spoil removal, uh, complete the site tidy and demobilize from site. So I suppose I think where we've done a lot of work in the last couple of years is with our survey design and implementation and modernizing that and getting the most out of, of the equipment. So because we are a project um, and are funded as a project, we're able to buy equipment specifically for the project and we can spend the time, you know, learning how to use it. So we, we've done a lot of work with this um, in the last couple of years. Um, so what we use at the moment is mostly um, Trimble. So in terms of our, our, our survey, we use uh, Trimble Access software to set up the jobs on the logger. Um, we use um, Trimble trolleys, which I'll go through in the next slide. Uh, then we use the we, the types of surveys we do with the Guido Rec, um, which is our, our just basically our, our surveying and Guido Track and Guido Vorses. So the um, Track and Vorses are for alignment methods. Uh, our processing, we use Guido Office in design. Then we're using Guido Nova Track for our designs. We're using Trimble Business Center to create our surface files, and also we're using Guido Tramp to, tamp to build our, our uh, tampon files. And from then, they, they can go directly into the machines, into machine control on our machines on site, and also into our tampon fleet. So in terms of the 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 survey, we used the Guido Rail Trolley, and um, it's it was a game changer for us from from when we started using it. Um, obviously, we've a lot of work to do, and it it it's, it suits our purposes um, exactly. Um, it can capture precise data on all the elements of the tack geometry in one run. It can be easily set up by one person. So we've a sur one surveyor out um, most nights of the week with this surveying up uh, for design. It's fast and efficient, so once you set it up, then you can work away at walking pace. It can capture data over long stretches of track, uh, which is what we need, and it, it can integrate with the GNSS rover and base or robotic total station or laser scanner as the user required. And as I said, with this, we're improving and learning all the time. Um, so, so, so what we're looking at now is uh, looking at Guido Borsi, so which means that, that the trolley can operate as part of a twin trolley system. And uh, we use Guido Borsi to, to compare design alignment to measure data. So, so what, what we're looking at is um, if we have a, a design and we have a tamper, we can run the trolley before the tamper to see how far off design it was. We could run it again after the tamper, and then this design file can be created on site and then be implemented into that tamper on the same night. So you're getting more bang for your buck from that tamping shift because you're getting it back to the, the exact design. Um, just some specifications on, on the equipment. So the GNSS based NOR12 roller, a rover, uh, system accuracy uh, plus minus two centimeters, CAD measurement accuracy plus or minus 0.5 millimeters, track gauge measurement accuracy plus or minus three millimeters, performance up to 3000 meters per hour, depending on who's doing the survey and the range from the base. So you can see in the picture there, we've our base station on the left hand side set up in the CES. So the range from that with TDL, which essentially gives it an extension is 1.5 miles, so um, you can get a lot of surveying done uh, with one setup. Uh, then the robotic total station, which we're using more and more of, the system accuracy is obviously a lot better because of it, it's a total station, so plus or minus three mil. Cant measurement accuracy then is plus or minus five millimeters. Cant gauge measurement accuracy plus or minus three millimeters, and the performance is up to 600 to 1200 meters per hour. And again, it depends on on, on uh, the conditions and who's doing the survey. Um, 
just to show you, Guido Office is what we use. So bring we bring our survey files into Guido Office, which um, allows us to process the data. Um, essentially allows us to interrogate the data. We can also uh, merge and amend uh, the surveys. If there's errors and things like that, we can fix them within this within this program. And we can also use it just to, to kind of to get more information on the site. Like, so you see there, it gives you, we can work out our, ta our tamp, our cant and our twist and radius and all, and all those things. Uh, and I mean, importantly, it, it, it exports files into whatever file type we need. So in terms of design now, we're using um, Guido Novatrack. Uh, so it's software for optimization, adjustment and alignment uh, calculations of existing rail line. So essentially what it does is you put the additional survey in, you, you, you do your design, it will give you an initial design and then you can, you can amend it as you see fit based on your parameters. And it, it works, uh, it gives you um, essentially a slew and a lift diagram. Um, so it analyzes measures points and generates optimal positions for both horizontal and vertical alignments. And you can compare new alignments with existing track positions. So that's your lift and your slew diagram. So if you're working through a platform, obviously you need to keep your slews down. If you've used things like bridges, as we do in the level crossings, you, you, you mightn't be able to slew in those areas. And it also can be used to compare uh, deviation between different alignments. Um, so that was, we worked with Trimble to, 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 to get that uh, suitable for the IR network, because I think when we got it initially, it was made more for the tighter gauge like they have in Europe. So we had to do a bit of a bit of work with them to, to, to uh, set it to a wider gauge and the, the issues that were around that. Um, then to continue with design, so we use Trimble Business Center to create the, the surface files for the machine. So 3D surface files are created for input into the machines to allow for a full 3D surface formation and separate surface files are needed for the different machines. So we have dozers, bobcats and excavators and we have different types of surface files for each machine. We can also use it for Guido Office to, to the, use the Guido TAMP function um, to create the TAMP files to be exported for TAMPer. Uh, there you can see a screenshot of a, of a tampon file that we're, we're creating. Um, and also um, you can see that there's a, the, the, the first uh, on the, the left hand side, you see the horizontal shift, um, you've uplift and can't error. <clears throat> so then to talk to site setup in terms of how this actually works on the ground once we have our designs and our files created. So uh, the surface files for the excavators, dozers and bobcats um, are uploaded from USB stick to the machine's grade control system. Um, we are currently trying to um, change that to a cloud based system. Uh, we have find kind of some issues with, you know, if you're relying on a, a USB stick, the USB stick might not work on a certain night or it might not upload. So to avoid all those issues, we're going to move to a cloud based system where we'll be able to send the designs directly to the machines, the files directly to the machines from from the office or from from your laptop. Um, so where Dozer and Bobcat uses GCS 900 machine control software. Our excavator uses Trimble Artworks machine control. Um, the GNSS base station, if we're using that, so our GSNS, which is essentially GPS, uh, our base station is set up over a control point and connected to the GNSS receiver on the machine. If we're using uh, UTS, so a total station setup, the total station is set up on the site, uh, backside to at least three other known control points and connected to the MT900 prism on the site. Um, so we often have both these um, setups on the one site because the, 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 the GSNSS is, is good, but you are um, if in areas of poor GPS coverage, it can disconnect from the machine and you lose accuracy. So in areas where you've got a tree canopy or, OP, or, or OBs, overbridges, things like that, um, what we tend to do is switch to the, the UTS system. So they can both be used on the one site. So if we look at our, our GPS is accurate to about 15 mil, and UTS can be accurate to below 10 mil. So we're getting great results from it. Um, and we are starting to use the total station system more just because the accuracy we find is so good for it and we don't have issues with um, losing GPS signal. So to show you what the actual the operator sees in the cab, um, on the left hand side you see the, the excavator. So he, he, what he's doing, you can see the the, the green area we say is the design, and he 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 has he's he's controlling the the bucket of the machine. 
So it's fully automated cross level control and the vertical control is oper is um, is controlled by the operator. Uh, so he's using that to to tell him how far down, how far up he needs to go. Then with the bob cash and dozer, they're fully operated. So the operator doesn't control the blade at all. Uh, he's just moving over and back. Um, when we move to a cloud based system, we will able to send files directly to the machines, but we'll also be able to get information back. So if we're with a ground sensor on the dozer blade, we'd be able to get uh, the exact levels that the that the, the, the ballast bed with the top of ballast, the, the top that it went into. Um, so that would avoid us or give us more information that we're achieving our design. Um, so then we're going to talk about um, the first of the two types of relay we do. So the first is, is panel relay. Um, obviously the reason it's called panel relay is because we install it in panels. Um, so the first stage of this is materials delivery. So we have um, 60 meter panels with new PTEC concrete sleepers with uh, under sleeper pads and slave second hand rails, which we call slave rails are delivered to site via materials train in advance of the relay works. Uh, the panels are placed in the cess where conditions allow. Uh, then our 144 meter continuous welded rails are delivered to site by our CWR trains. Uh, all our sleepers now have under uh, pad sleepers, which will increase the, the lifespan of the sleepers. Uh, in terms of site preparation, then so we've cut an embankment preparation. So if we're using the the the, the cess for panels to placement and storage, we need to make sure that our, our cuttings and embankments are, are able to 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 take that and also ballast storage. We'd have to have ballast in a nearby location. Um, so we start a clamshelling. So this is where we we use a clamshell bucket on an excavator to empty out the empty out the box. So we were able to do one and four prior to our TSR, our temporary speed restriction going on. Once we our temporary speed restriction goes on, which is 25 miles an hour, we're able to clean out all the boxes and the sleeper ends. And we also do our side cuts when, when our 16 when our 25 mile an hour temporary speed restriction is on as well. So track to be renewed is cut into 60 meter panel lengths and clamped, uh, plated and cabled. And here we see a, a site ready for prep. So we have our our, our clamshell and completion. All the boxes are empty. Uh, we have our panels stored in the cess, and we've also you're going to see that what we've clamshelled out, we've put into the five foot of the adjacent road, and this can be reused then as part of the work. So then, if we talk about our panel installation process, so typically uh, we work on a 17 hour possession. Uh, we, so this would be from about 5 p.m. Saturday evening to 10 a.m. Sunday morning. So once we have our possession, the first stage would be would be the panel removal. So we've labor staff that remove all the clamping system. Then we've ORV excavators and trailers remove the old panels from the adjacent road and transfer to uh, designated storage locations. And typically we'd have two to three pairs of ORV excavators on site, depending on depending on the site constraints. Uh, so once we have the panels out, we can start our formation work. So what we tend to do is we have two RV excavators working ahead to remove the excess overburden. And then these are followed by two GPS or UTS dozers. And what they do they is apply the design formation level. So you have the, the, the most of the, the overburden is taken away by our um, excavators and uh, the GPS the, um, dozers are putting put the final design on it. Uh, the output is monitored by technical staff using a cross line laser and dips from the adjacent road. So what I said earlier on, if we're using to move into a cloud blade system, we would have at the moment we, we, we they, they take dips about every every 10 meter changes. Uh, once we move to a cloud blade system, we would have that information along the whole length of the site. So it would be a big plus for us. Uh, following the dozers, then we've our BOMAG with area control roller uh, to apply compaction to the ballast bed. Uh, just to talk a little bit on our, our compaction. So this is something that we've done a lot of work in in the last couple of years. So initially when we started the project, we had two smaller five ton rollers that, that we were operating on the sites. And while they were doing a good job in terms of the, you know, the, the regulating the ballast and um, keeping it smooth for the, the sleepers to be laid down on, we had no idea what it was leaving in terms of uh, of compaction. Um, so we moved to uh, very controlled rollers because we can set the target stiffness. Uh, we can get uniform compaction, uh, elimination of soft spots. We know crushing the stone and obviously really important. We have um, uh, compaction documentation so that we have uh, the documentation for every site to say that it's being compacted as we need it to be. Um, so then following the, the order, we start our panel installation process. 
So our new panels are lifted into place by two 30 to 35 ton excavators. Uh, they're lifted into approximate six foot dimensions. So the six foots are written on the on the outer edge of the adjacent rail, uh, the adjacent road, and use this to, to drop them into approximate positions. So when each panel is installed, the excavators move forward and repeat the process for the, for the next panel until they reach the end of the site. Uh, following the excavators then, the rail ends are clamped together uh, using UIC 54 fish plates and G-clamps. And if the panels are not stored in site, they're ferried to uh, ferried to site. If the panels are not stored in site, they're ferried to site in the adjacent road. So they're lifted in from the RVs from the adjacent road. So just to illustrate that point, the picture on the left hand side, the panels have been stored on the embankment. So they're lifted in by the excavators as they move along. The picture on the right hand side, there was no room in the cess. Uh, so they were lifted in uh, off, the, off the trailer that was ferried to site. Um, then to continue on, so once our, all our panels in, we, we horizontal lining and ballasting. So our new panels are lined to the correct six foot and dimension at 10 meter stations on straights, five meter stations on curves using um, what we call the muscle man. Uh, the ballast is applied across from the five foot um, of the adjacent road. And also as soon as possible, we have dumpers which are transport, transporting um, ballast from the compound to the site. Uh, the ballast is completed using either the, the high output ballast system, so that's our Hobbs train, uh, RV heavy haulage system, or, or, or uh, fully ballasted up with RV dumpers. Um, then ballast is regulated into new panels using RV excavators with plow buckets. So in terms of our, our, our ballasting, on the left hand side you see our, our, our heavy haulage system. So there's six traders in that and we can take up to 120 tonnes. Uh, our Hobbs train, which is the one that everyone wants to see coming, so our Hobbs train can take 375 tonnes. And then on the, the right hand side, you see our dumpers, so they're seven tonne dumpers. Um, so then uh, the, 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 the tamping head, so at the end of the shift or near the end of the shift, hopefully, uh, the, we have to pack the start and the end of the site, so the tail in, the tail out. Uh, we use an RV excavator with a tamping head. Uh, the panel is jacked as requi uh, required and cross level checked using a track gauge and uh, the tamping head packs a minimum of eight boxes of existing track um, as far as required into the new track to achieve a, a smooth transition between the new and the old sections. We do sometimes have uh, tampers on the site, um, but we, we, we would always make sure that we, we use the tamping head on the tail in and tail out. So, there's obviously a lot of machines on the site, so I just did the diagram just to show the, the, the site progression and how it works. Um, because obviously it's important that you get the machines on and off in the right order. Uh, so working from the right hand side, so the first we have our RV excavators working in pairs to remove the old track panels. Uh, following that we have our two excavators, two dozers working in the dig to apply the design formation levels. Following that we have our, our vario control roller uh, behind the dozers compacting the new formation. Following that, we have our excavators installing the new panels, and then we have our, our muscle man lining the, the line in the new panels. So it's it's straightforward uh, when you see it laid out like that. Um, sometimes it's not always straightforward in sight, though. So then possession handback. So obviously when the work is done, it's handed back to um, at a TSR 25 miles an hour. So the newly related section is checked for section is checked for twist faults with our track geometry trolley. Uh, all the joints are checked and the lines clear by the engineers and supervisor uh, before site is handed back at 25 miles an hour. So we use our amber trolley to check for twist defects. So it continually measures the track. So gauge can not twist, uh, set up Irish rail profiles so we can set it for short twist, medium twist, long twist. Um, it alerts the user when any out of tolerance is valued is measured. So if there was twist left in it, uh, it can be we can be jacked that section and tamp it with the tamping head before it goes back to lines to, to the to, on the to open to traffic. Uh, the results can also be forwarded on to the relevant staff uh, straight the site once the survey has been completed. So the engineer there that he's checking that at, when, when he's finished a shift, he sends on a report for uh, an engineer shift report and he also sends on the survey to, to, to the, the project managers and the senior engineers on the project. Uh, then follow on works. So, so this is the following week. So the site is ALC tamped to remove any defects. On the Monday night following the panel installation works, 
uh, re-railing and site wells then are completed from Tuesday to Thursday night. So we have secondhand rail installed in the panels, so they're removed and the site's re-railed with, uh, with our 144 metre continuously welded rail. Uh, final design tamp is completed on Friday. Uh, stressing then is, com is completed on the Saturday night with a hand back to line speed the following morning. So that's two weeks from the initial TSR application. And then the, the, the following that we'd have finished up our site tidy, which would be our scrap, scrap train, removing all the bits of scrap we have around the place. Any work that's left in terms of our, our embankment, spoil tidy works and RV sweeping. We'd also plan for a regulator shift or OTM regulator um, a, a couple of weeks after the works. And then just to put that in a timeline, so uh, obviously like the ballast cleaner does more than just what happens in, in within the 17 hour possession. So we say week one, we do our cutting and embankment prep, uh, one of four clamshelling and, and then panels and CWR uh, rails delivered to site. On the Saturday of week one, then our 25 mile hour TSR goes on, which allows us to do our full prep, which is our site cuts, our full clamshell and our panel relaying, which is done the end of week two, um, the Saturday into the Sunday. Uh, following that, then in week three, we've our ALC tamping or re-railing, site wells, um, design tamp stressing, and then finally return to line speed um, at the end of week three. Um, we'd also, in this within the 17 hour possession, we would get done as much as possible. So we often get some re-railing done and some welding done within within the 17 hour possession, and then it's completed the following week. Uh, week four then is site tidy, so RV sweeping and demobilized from site. So that's our, our pan relaying. So the other type of relaying we do is our is our gantry relaying. So um we've had these gantries in the company a long time and um, they're after getting a new paint job in that picture um but but they're still um they're still doing a good job um so in terms of our materials delivery so i'm going to go through the same process now but just there's a couple of differences with with the gantries so our 144 meter continuous welded rails are delivered to site by cwr train in advance of the works and sleepers are delivered to site on the relay train uh, during the relay and shift so it gives us an advantage there because we don't have to deliver the sleepers um, in advance of the works so our site prep then is our service rail installation. So the, 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 the rails, the CWR rails that are delivered to site, these are installed to design levels in the six foot in the cess. And these provide um, uh, rails for the gantry cranes to, to, to move up and down the site on. Um, clamshelling then, again, one and four prior to TSR, and then all ballast boxes and ends of sleepers once our 25 mile hour TSR goes on. Uh, site cuts, uh, track to be renewed, cut into 60 meter panels and clamp uh, plated and K-goed. So the, ga the gantry installation process then, once we have our possession, so a big difference between our gantries and our panels is our panels mostly is done at the weekend, so we have a longer possession, so we have a 17 hour disrupted possession, where the gantries always traditionally, they would have worked midweek, so they work in short possessions, so they, they'll, they'll, they'll get less done, but the advantage of the gantries is that they take a lot of the a lot of the, the waste material away with them, um, so we, they, they'll get less work done, but they're able to work in um, shorter possessions, and actually just in the last year, we started working our panel relaying sites in shorter possessions as well, but um, just for, for this example, we're going to say the gantry installation process, it's, it, it's within a short um, midweek possession of four to six hours. So uh, first panel removal, so the labour staff complete the site cuts at 60 metre intervals. Our RV excavators lift panel out of the ground and place them on top of the ballast bed. Then the panels are cleaned down for our labour staff. And once the, um, once the cleaned um, excavators can stack the panels at the designated locations or the gantry cranes can remove them and put them directly onto the machine for it to be uh, removed. Again, the formation works. So uh, while the same process, there is different machines. So we have one RV excavator and two uh, RV GPS excavators uh, removed to work the excess overburden. So that works uh, ahead of it, ahead of the um, the the bobcat. So following that, we have one GPS UTS bobcat to apply design and the final design formation level. And the reason we use the bobcat and not the dozers, as the previous example, is that. Uh, because of the service rail, it'd be difficult to, the, the dozer would be finding it difficult to work within that tighter space. And since the gantry cranes are moving up and down the site, the gantries need to be able to go over um, the, the, the uh, bobcat. So in this case, when the gantries are dropping their sleepers, they're actually dropping them ahead of the bobcat, which I'll, I'll show um, in, in the next couple of slides. Um, so that's why we looked at um, 
a smaller version of the dozer, which is the bob cache. So output is monitored by technical staff using the cross line laser and dips from the adjacent road. Uh, following this, where BOMAG variable control roller follows the Bobcat to apply compaction. And again, the, the, the previous example, it, it was a larger 16 ton roller, so we needed a solution that we could work on the gantry sites. So we use a smaller, so it's the BMAG BW145 D5 roller. So we have three of these that we use in the network now. So it's a small five ton roller, but it, it, it does the same job really. Uh, the report's slightly different um, in that it kind of overlays it on the map, but it's the same. It, we can set targets and stiffening values. Uh, we have uniform compaction, elimination of soft spots, and um, it, it most importantly provides uh, um, compaction documentation. So the gantry installation process, so the gantry cranes dismount the train and mount the service rail. So once they come off the train, the, the, they're set on top of the service rail. So that's why it's important the service rail is installed at the correct position. Um, so new slippers are, and sleepers are lifted off the train and dropped into the approximate low position by the gantries starting at the opposite end of the train. So it goes to the opposite end of the dig, so it goes over the roller and the, the bobcat and it drops the sleepers. Um, it, the panel, it can lift 36 metres of sleepers at one time, so that's 55 sleepers. And uh, the clearance of the gantries is 2.8 meters. Uh, the gantries are also able to lift the old panels onto the train uh, once new sleepers have been installed for removal off site in the same night. So that's that's a big advantage to the gantries. Um, once we have um, the, the 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 sleepers in place, we do our horizontal lining and ballasting. So once the gantries are finished traversing the site, the service rail is pulled into position using the rail threader. So the rail that the the gantries are actually travelling on, our CWR rail, is pulled into position and tied down on top of the sleepers. Uh, new panels are lined to the correct six foot dimensions at ten meter stations using the muscle man. Ballasting is then completed using our Hobbs train or RV HHS or um, RV dumpers. So it's usually a combination of two of those. Uh, RV excavators with plow buckets regulate the ballast into the new panels and at that stage then it's the same as the panel so in terms of our tamp and head and possession handbag it's the same as the, as the panel relay so again just to lay out the site progression so we have the relay train on the right hand side then we have our excavators working on the adjacent road to remove the old panels uh, then we have our excavators uh, one rv excavator and two gps excavators which removed excess overburden uh, following that, we've our GPS, UTS, Bobcat putting the final level in the ballast bed. Uh, we've our very controlled roller, and you can see there, that's where your sleeper drop is. So our gantries come off the relay train, uh, go along the site over the GPS, uh, Bobcat over the roller, and that's where it drops the sleeper's head and moving, working back towards the train. Uh, following this, then we've our rail threader pulling in our CWR and um, our muscle man lining the new panels. So following this, the follow on works would be, uh, so this is taking the example that we're really in midweek, so we have our shorter possession. So our site wells are completed. So say if we if we were relaying on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday night normally, so our site wells are completed from Tuesday to Saturday night. Our site is design tamped on the Thursday night, uh, an ALC tamped on the Friday night, stress is completed the following weekend on the Friday or Saturday night. Um, site like site handed back to line speed on the Sunday morning and then so that's one week after the initial TSR. Um, so following that we've our site um site tidy completed. So although the gantries it's not getting as much done as the panels, we only have our TSR on for 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 one um week. So in terms of dealing with operations and our TSRs and working within our TSR minutes, uh, there's advantages to using the gantries. Uh, the timeline then, so uh, say if week one we prep the ground with the rail drop, uh, our CWR rails deliver to site, uh, we sink our service rails to design levels. Site two, then we have our, 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 our full site prep, uh, uh, which our TSR goes on, then we have our full um, clam shelling, um, our TSR goes on. Week three then, midweek we're doing our gantry laying, uh, we're also doing our site wells, we have our tamper in and we're doing our stress in the end of week three. And then week four, once we're going back to line speed, we finish up our site tidy to be RV sleeping and demobilized from site. So to talk about the productivity and where we've, we've gone with the project. So we started ballast cleaning with our OGM ballast cleaner in 2015. At that stage in one 14 hour shift, our average output was 800 meters in 2019 because we were using single line work and we were going to 37 hours. Our average output was 2520 in 2021. Then this improved further to our average output on the 37 hour single line work and weekend was at 3240. So that that, that that's maxing out, we'd say at 3240. Um, 
and that's assuming uh, nothing went wrong, but we do regularly achieve those sorts of figures. So that's 100%, 152% increase on, I would say, uh, meter per hour on 2015. In terms of the relay, and so in 2015, our panel relay in, in an eight hour shift, our average output was 320 meters. In 2016, we would move to a 12 hour shift, and our average output was 640 meters. Uh, 20, 18 then to a 14 hour shift and we went up to 864 meters and then finally last year in 2021 uh, we were getting an average output of uh, 11,034 meters on a 17 hour shift and that's 165 percent increase on 2015. So uh, obviously uh, productivity is great but um, quality is is just as important and just a couple of the results that we have so um, we are able to install our track now within 20 mil, 20 mil of the vertical tolerance and 5 mil um, horizontal tolerance. So we're, we're getting super results, and it's a, we get those with the with the with GNSS and and the UTS. But um, we we are moving more towards UPS because the the results are so good. A pre tramp installed track can be installed with only minor twist defects. Uh, we get verified results, um, so now we have results on compaction, uh, results on geometry, so we have our, our reports from our tamper, we have our trolley surveys, we have our amber trolley surveys. We're also using System 7 in one of our tampers, which gives us um, essentially the, the, the design tamper bank, so we, but we have more information with regard to the track stiffness, um, which we can use going forward. So I know there's a lot of talk about digital twins and things like that, so we're trying to, I suppose, not only gathered information, but but we want to use it going forward. Um, the increased quality um, enables us to hand back at higher speed. So this is something we've worked on um, at, at, as part of the project. So um, our standard TSR for this type of work is 25 miles an hour, and it has been for, for decades. So what we were tasked with is try to move to a higher speed handback. So um, we started really by just making sure we could get the quality doing it over and over again and then we had to build our documentation around it so uh, we had to build our own track uh, progressive track construction assurance document uh, we got great help from from some guys over there at network rail which kind of let us know what they did and we we, we kind of mirrored that but we had to adjust it based on, on what we could do so we can now three sites we had the three sites back this year at um at 50 mile an hour so that was that was twice the, the standard TSR of, of 25 miles an hour. So it was a really big step for us. And where we where we hope to get to what our, our, our CEO has tasked us with is uh, completing 2.5 miles of relay and at 75 miles an hour. Um, that would be working single line um, to, to, to get your 2.5 miles and the 75 miles an hour, obviously. So 75 is a bit up from 50, but I think the initial step was a big one. And I think to get to 75 won't be as big a step, um, obviously, but there will be a lot of work in it. Um, and obviously, uh, as well, we we have increased passenger comfort and decreased uh, journey time. So we have a number of uh, P permanent speed restrictions on the Cork line, and we are removing them as we go along so depending on what they are so we have some associated with um with, with, with geometry that we're able to remove we've other associated with with poor ground conditions so we're able to remove that so uh, we hope to have six minutes back we'd say by the end of the by the end of the um by the end of the project um we our track recording vehicle uh, we run that to the cork line four times four times a year and that has showed increased tqi so that's our tech track quality index on, on all our sites. So um, we have to remember the end user. It's important that um, that, that we're doing this for our, our passengers and uh, the, 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 the better TQI is, we, we, it means there's a there's, there's better ride comfort. And that's the end of my presentation. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, thanks for listening and I'll take any questions. Okay, thanks. Thanks now. That was great. Um, there's quite a few questions on the chat I'll run through with you. I was just going to ask one myself first, if that's all right, get out of the way. Yeah. On. Uh, just while it's fresh in my head, when you were saying there about the heading towards line speed handback and you've managed to go from 25 to 50, which is excellent. Um, I was quite interested in, in your BOMAG roller printouts, which give you obviously really detailed information on the stiffness achieved, and that's something that's even used in the high speed, line speed handbacks. 
So what what else are you missing? Do you think is it? Do you need more possession time, or is it to get stressing done, or have you considered DTS as well to try and get? Yeah, I I suppose we 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 have a DTS, but it 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 hasn't been used much. Um, I think. I, I, I know in, in in other networks that they're using the DTS for, for their for their really high handbag. So I'm I'm not 100 sure if we would need the DTS for 75, but I think obviously um, settlement is an issue. Um, we had we had many debates on temporary joints even at 50 mile an hour, and the the method we went down is we got the whole we got the whole site welded up. Um, but there was just a couple of issues around temporary joints we weren't happy with, and we know. For 75, that's going to be out. Um, and then th th there's a couple of issues around that. There's also a couple of issues around around documentation and uh, and compliance and things like that. Because we say we've had the 25 mile an hour uh, standard TSR for decades, so we say all our standards, all our documentation is geared towards that. So it's a kind of a new way of thinking, and there's kind of we have to kind of. Uh, Make sure that we're still within our standards, even if we're trying to do something new. So it's a, you know it it some it does involve we say amending some standards, rewriting some standards. Um, the compaction we get very good results. So we'd be very initially we got the big roller. Um, we had looked at other methods. Um, to verify compaction because there was no we, there was no very control roller or not an ORB roller in the country at the time. And um, we, we we looked at using a fall and weight effectometer um, to kind of the test using using the rollers that we we had at the time using a fall and weight effectometer to see what the track bed stiffness was at the moment because we knew the figure that we wanted to get to uh, to allow us to hand back at um at um 50 miles an hour, and then we have a couple of plant contractors that we use, and they were kind of they invested in the process really. So we have a couple of plant contractors on the framework and. They invested in that. They 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 got those rollers. So while we do the work ourselves, we um our plan we we have plan contractors we work with, and that's who we hire all the plan from. So initially we got the big roller in. Uh, we're very happy with the results from that. Then we were using we got the smaller roller in from the gantries, and now we have two more of those. Um, but again, compaction is I wouldn't say it's completely solved because compaction in ballast is kind of it's tricky. It's not like compacting sand. Um, we'd have to decide. We'd say for the tire speed, what what are we happy with in terms of compaction levels? And that's that's a question. I think that's still out there. Okay, thanks. Yeah, it was just interesting because even with this, so over here we're doing one two five for speeds like that. Handbag, we've only really started using that that type of roller to and focusing so much on the the quality of the compaction. So it just seemed. Yeah, yeah I mean, anecdotally. What we could say is, uh, as soon as we started using these rotors, so obviously the, the track will always go off. So we we we'd follow up with a design temp, um, you know, about a week later, and then we do another design temp about three months later because because the track does go off after a certain amount of of, of traffic, and we'd say that we've noticed that the designs in terms of the work you have to do with the designs since we started doing the roller. It's the I mean the lifts and the slew, it still goes off a bit, but the, your your lifts are less. So. That would anecdotally tell you it is working, but again, it's 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 important that we have the verified compaction, that we have our our document there to say that, yeah, it's um it's um it, it's all good, and even would say working through certain areas, uh, the where we we have a problem that a lot of our overbridges in that we have issues with drainage and things like that, and um, you know issues that the ballast cleaner might not be able to get through, and the. We tend to find problems there. The roller does detect any issues there, so we 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 tend to have some soft spots there that the roller will pick up. So I mean, it's making sense what it's telling us as well. Like so, it's making sense where it's getting high high results. It's making sense where it's getting no results. But again, the roller will give you a report, but you, you still need an engineer to interpret it. Um, and that's that's something I think we need to do a bit more work on. Excellent, thanks. Um, I've just run through some of the questions on online then. So Angus, as I said, um, he's interested in adaptations made to achieve gauge adjustment on maintenance machines and on-track plant coming from out with Ireland. Please comment on on-track plant availability for upgrades and how adaptions are made. And is there any issues with engineering acceptance, etc.? 
Um, well, as I said, we, we, we work with uh, certain plan contractors that are on a uh, framework in terms of, uh, you know, dozers and, and yellow plants and things like that. So we, we while, while they do work, like, you know, we, we do have good options. I, I, I guess that there's probably more options in other areas because because of the of the different gauge. But like, it's not it's not a problem. And in terms of then our, our yellow plant or our, our machines, um, I don't. It, it, it's never been a problem that I've heard of that we we couldn't get a machine because of because of the um, b, b, because of we we have a different gauge, and I suppose it's something because I've always worked in this on this gauge. I I I don't I don't know how big of a problem it is. You might have to ask the the guys in production. Um, uh, but but um, it's I I I I don't know how big of a problem it is really because. I've never. We. I don't think we've ever had issues. I mean, even in terms of getting the roller, once the plant contractor knew we wanted it, we were able to get it. Uh, we have our fleet of tampers. Um, uh, we have our ballast cleaner. Um, obviously, when you're purchasing such a big um, item, it's in planning for years, really, probably. Uh, when we do get a P, uh, new equipment like that, it has to go through what's an APIS process over here. So that is acceptance through um, through our CRR, which is our regulation body. Um, that, that is quite an onerous process, um, but it is it is more to do with the regulations over here as opposed to trying to get something accepted. But it, it, it's not an issue that I've heard of. OK, Magic. Um, David Lindsay is asking, was there a continuous alignment design for the whole route or a smoothing design localised in sections? Localized, I'd say. Um, so, because uh, we're kind of ideally, we would start in Dublin and relay the whole uh, line all the way to um, to Cork. But because of the way we work, we can't do that. So a lot of the time, we're jumping around to different areas. Um, ideally, I'd love to be able to just survey the whole line and have a design. But we are working as a project in divisions where there's other work going on, so it wouldn't make sense to, sense to get too much ahead of yourself because a division could call a tamper in and change the alignment. That's your design thrown out. Um, also, um, we have we're limited in terms of the resources that we have to do that much surveying. So our surveying is never more than two or three weeks ahead of where they're going to be in terms of the relaying. And the relaying is based on more than just where's it needs it. So we have um, we have a priority list of where we need to go to first. And that's because uh, in the past, uh, the, 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 the repairs were localized. So we could have a section that's 1979 rail in a section of 2020 rail. So obviously that would be high priority over, would say what's down further. Also we're working in TSR minutes, so we've an up road and a down road. Sometimes we're limited on our, we're at our max with our TSR minutes on one road, so we need to go to the other road. So that's all those other um, um, conditions that we have to meet. Um, but I'd love to be able to just, we'd say, do, just design the whole line and work to that, but it just doesn't work like that in reality. Yeah, okay. All right, uh, Tom's asking, um, in terms of design, what you've described is the methodology to reinstate the track like for like with minor adjustments, which is fine when the existing alignment is good horizontally and vertically, but in terms of compliance with design standard, standards, who is responsible for design? Well, um, we, be, Irish Rail, we, we, we set our own standards in that we have a regulating body, which is the CRR, but um, we, when our standards are national standards because we are the railway body within um, Ireland. So our designs are, we're designing for 100 miles an hour. So um, there's talk of, uh, of lines going to 125, but I don't think it's going to happen very soon. Um, in a lot of cases, our alignment is quite good. Um, the, the vertical is generally quite good. So where we have an issue is around curves. So um, some of our curves need um, 
substantial amount of work. Now it's not impossible, but there is very significant work to do. At, so at, at the time to do it is at your relay process, because when you put your you take your track out, you can drop it into any position you have. So it's not easy to drop the track into a slew of uh, uh, drop the track into the correct position rather than try and get a damper to slew it, um, you know, 200 mil one way and 300 mil another way. Um, but all our designs it were designed are our, our, we have a design standard within Irish Rail, so um, the the design software that I brought up earlier on, that's actually been our design then our parameters are being applied to that design software. Uh, we're designing for a minimum of 100 mile an hour throughout. Uh, there is sections of that line that is um, 90 mile an hour. Um, so in those cases, uh, we're designing we 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 get those sections up to 100, except for a couple of areas where. Um, Due to due to the location that you would probably never get more than 90 miles an hour. Um, but uh, again, it's it's um, we we'll say I do work for the technical department, so I would have oversight over all the designs. But we have a designer on the project as well full time. I think the point I was trying to make, Niall, was what you're doing is very local. It's yeah. local temporary benchmarks are no reference to snake grids or ordinance datums or any of that stuff. You're looking at a section of track that you need to view and you go out there, you survey it and you put it back to where it is at the moment with yeah. minor adjustments to improve what's there at the moment yeah. in terms of horizontal and vertical programme, which, which for me is a step back to when I was out on track, that was yeah. exactly how I did. I never I had no idea what snake grid was when it first was invented. I knew exactly where my TBMs were. I knew exactly where the lifts and slews needed to be applied to make the track better than it was at the moment. And in terms of compliance with the standard, well, I was improving exactly what was there before. So why wouldn't it comply with the standard? Mm. Which is different from how we would tackle the problem here in the UK. If we had 220 miles of track to be new in the UK, the first thing we would do is send a horde of survey parties out to survey and reference it to the ordnance survey grid and then that would be translated into a snake grid various design tools and cad instruments would be applied to generate designs which would then be faithfully installed by the site installation teams there are some titters running around the room at the moment but that, that's the idea that would happen. What you've done is a very practical answer to the pres that what was presented to you. You were presented with, you need to renew 220 miles of track uh, pronto, I think the Indian's name was, yeah. very quickly. You have to go out and do it now, otherwise yeah. you're going to be running trains. And I think yeah. what you've done is a very refreshing approach to that. It's a very practical approach to that. And I think your end result justifies exactly what you've done. It, it, it's funny, but I actually had a conversation um, about Snake Grid just this week. Um, so Dublin to Cork line, most of that is is very rural. Um, you, you're, you're, you, you'll see your mileposts and you'll see you'll see um, your signals, things like that. But there's not we, we, we don't have we say in permanent infrastructure to install permanent benchmarks and all that. But Actually, our DART line, which is the electrified line, we're, we're, we're looking to undertake the project to install our permanent uh, benchmarks on all the stanchions and get get out, out, out up to snake grid and, and all that. So uh, it, it, it's more of um, I, I, again, we, we had a problem and again, the solution to it. But at the same time, I would love to be able to say, well, you know, we, we, we looked at snake grid for it and we looked at all that like a more modern technique. Um, but it, 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 we just we don't we we didn't have the resource we don't have the resources to do that. So it is this has all been done internal. This is this is all Irish Rail. So the project is staffed by by Irish Rail internal staff. We have our, our plan contractors we work to. But again, we have we we have we have one surveyor or two surveyors who are literally out all the time. And again, we're trying to. Uh, we're trying to do our best, improve things, but we are limited in that there's, there's only a certain amount of us here. We, we don't tend to, we, we, we wouldn't have as many, we say, subcontractors, because the railway is privatised well, in the UK, you obviously have a load of subcontractors that you can, you can call on. Wasn't that a criticism in any way? It was oh, I understand, I, I understand that, but I suppose... 
no, from my no. view, I, I would like to be more involved in snake grid and and and, and seeing all that part of it as as well. Like, well, um, the would be, is the end result actually any better with snake grid than what it is when you do it? What you produce is absolutely an article which is fit for purpose. Yeah, why would yeah, you want to spend yeah. any more money to produce an article that's equally fit for purpose? Yeah, which just happens yeah. to be reference to a snake grid. Yeah. Uh, absolutely, and I think a big advantage—a a big advantage that we have—is um, the people working on the project. They, they really they, they know the areas because it's all internal, um, and because we're a semi-state body. Um, the, the, you know, we we the project manager is out there walking the track the following day. He's probably out on nights. People are very invested in in the in the work. Um, because it's again, we're we're the company. We we run the railway ourselves. So there's obviously yeah, there's big differences the between a, a, a semi stage and and the privatised. To the days of British Rail, the ownership was was key. People yeah. had their area that they looked after and they took pride in it. Yeah. These days we have the silos. We have got the surveyors. We've got the designers, the installers, and then the poor maintainer at length, who's left to mother and father. What's left? Yeah, I don't absolutely. Yeah. Necessarily, with the advent of modern technology, Bentley Power Rail Track, Bentley Open Rail Designer, whatever you call it, I don't think necessarily that because of all this technology, we're producing a better end result than what we used to produce yeah. with optical instruments, strings and bubbles, and the kind of thing that you've got. You've got the benefit of modern survey technology, the GEDO machine. Yeah, that is great for referencing local alignments and allows yeah. you to do that local alignment design where we send the survey team out. They're interested in the ordnance grid. They're interested yeah. in the datums. They produce wonderful, you know, six decimal figures of a millimeter design drawings and the like. And at the end of the day, somebody's left to go and install it to the best of their ability. Yeah. And then we report, you know, everything was as good. Uh, the as constructed was exactly as designed. Yeah, yeah. I don't think that's quite true, but we accept it. And I think there's lessons to be learned from what you do that could be adopted in the UK. And I'm quite sure there's a few consultant designers on the call who are quaking in their shoes thinking, I don't know, I've been made redundant. And I might be one of them. They think oh, so there's a better way to do renewal of the kind of thing that you're looking at to say from a practical approach, Get out there, survey the rails you've got in the ground, improve what's there, and replace it back. Call the job a good one, and then go. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I take your point, and there is there's there's massive advantages to 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 the way we work, which we're afforded because because as you said, we have ownership over the assets. So, um, like I I walk all these sites with the the the, the technical lead and the regional manager for infrastructure of the areas. Um, so it's 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 we have, and I know these guys. I've worked with them years. So there is that you're you're linked to it, and you are invested in it. Okay, thanks for that. Um, so another one from Angus is asking um, panel delivery to assess where conditions allow. Um, let's call that in quotation marks. Where where do panels go if there's no space in the assess? And also he's asking is tandem lift of panels integrated through one control system or is each machine independent? So if 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 the panels um, can't be delivered to site, so can't be stored in the CES um, because of any embankment issues. So just we we, we, we have um, we we have our embankments are all set up as assets. So we have a lot of we have inspection reports, we have a, a decision support tools, so we have risk management tools. So It'd be highlighted to us if there was any um, issues with the embankment. We also have local knowledge because we'd walk the sites with with the the the, the guys who are responsible for that patch. So if there was any question over um, a, a embankment being higher risk, what we do we'd ferry the panels to the site on uh, rail trailers. Um, in in the case of taking the, the the panels away, the same thing is that if there was nowhere to store the panels, uh, we'd we'd remove them in rail trailers. Now. You wouldn't you wouldn't be um, 
take them away for 20 miles like you'd find some we'd have access points and things like that that we can we can store it so we would use rail trailers but it will it does slow down the job and it means that you mightn't get as much done um but it, it's it's necessary um then in terms of of the tandem lifting um at the moment they are they are independent but we will be looking for to move to a system where the two of them are linked um so in terms of tandem lifting we have uh, quite um owners controls on our on our, our tandem lifting plans and the way they're they're managed on site um, but we do want to improve on that so we're looking at systems where the two machines are tied together um because there obviously is um an additional risk with 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 tandem lifting uh, with with two separate excavators. So, uh, David was asking in the ballast cleaning operation, was there any scope to unload the spoil into a train on the adjacent road rather than the cess, or was it always an adjacent line open scenario? No, so it depends. So that the, the thirty seven hour single line working, um, that would be. <coughs> In those cases, you're limited that you can't have machines on the adjacent road. Um, but we work within different possessions. So um, now this year it's all single line working, but last year we worked in 12 hour possessions on the weekend uh, where we'd say the whole line is closed. So you would have the option to have um, trains on the opposite road. Um, but we, we, we've, we've a spoil train that we use also. We could take it away in dumpers and things like that. But we do allow for side casting onto into the cess um we have an agreement with the technical guys again we, we have a lot of information on the embankments and the cuttings too so if there's high risk there that we, we'd avoid that and sometimes they're not space um but we 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 make sure that we we tidied it up after we've taken everything away after um but it's um it depends on it depends on the location but we have we have we have different options in different areas excellent I have to take a, a big breath now. I've got a huge comment from Tom to read out. So, <laughs> it just just actually on 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 the, on the spoil, it's um it, it, we find that the the local landowners are, are absolutely dying to get their hands on the spoil because I think it's meant to be very good for making roads and things like that. Um, so we've always lads looking in, asking questions, saying where where are you taking that and and where can I get some of it? Thanks. Okay. Um. I'll move on to one from David Lindsay again. Um, if the Jito trolley is used to check track position following installation, can this not also measure twist, or is it Belt and Brace's approach to use both Amber and the Jito systems? If we were using the, um, I suppose the advantage with the Amber is that it will, as you move it along, it will, it will. Um, beep to to, uh, to alert you to twist and it's a lot easier to read um the guido trolley uh, it's a survey trolley so um it, it will tell you twist but at the same time it, it won't it won't um the red light won't go off so uh, we'd always run the amber it's part of our process is to run the amber at the handback you also could have a different engineer it, it, if we're using our guido trolley you'd have our engineer our survey engineer there doing that um and that could be separate to to the handbag engineer so again most we'd always look to run, run our run our um run our amber trolley um, at handbag uh, we wouldn't tend to use even if we were even if we were using it to check the alignment we wouldn't tend to use the the guido trolley even though it will measure twist we also have the profiles for Irish Rail standards built into our amber trolley. So although the Guido trolley will give you a measurement of twist, it won't tell you, it won't alert you to what threshold has been reached. That makes sense, cheers. Uh, Tom's asking that um, regarding the disposal of life expired concrete sleepers, are they crushed and recycled or are they sent to landfill? I, I don't know for sure, but I, they, I think I, I think they're crushed. Um, we have a sleeper plant, so we have a we have a, a big production apartment in the middle of the country in Port Leash, and I um I cannot answer that for sure, but I I think they are crushed. The reason why I was asking that was because um, when asked the same question of Network Rail, I was told that crushing and recycling, in other words, taking the the rebar and the cast iron out of concrete sleeper and crushing it for maybe to use as engineer fill. 
uh, is not cost effective. In other words, it costs more to crush and separate than it does to <laughs> to throw it in the landfill. So they throw them in the landfill. Well, um, I, I have that heard that as well. So um, you are that is ringing a bell. So um, possibly we are we do do that because I I know that um, it, it, I was given the same thing that it, it wasn't cost effective to to crush them. So possibly we are just uh, throwing them in the dump somewhere. Another one from Tom was saying logistics must be a problem feeding the site with ballast, rails, plants, sleepers, manpower. How is this controlled on the project? Do you have virtual quarries, dedicated train plans and staff rosters? Yeah, so um, we have, um, uh, obviously there's a huge amount of planning goes into it. So we have a project manager for each um, aspect for the ballast cleaning, the, um, the pannery lane and the gantry lane and they are in so they, they they come up with their, their 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 plan for the year and they work with our production department so it's a case of our the book the production department controls the the delivery of all materials and it's a case that you you, you have to book uh all your 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 materials your trains everything in advance uh we have our own staff rosters we have our internal team that do relay but we do rely on contract labor as well sometimes we also rely on each division has a as a permanent waste staff, we also rely on our permanent waste staff coming in from there to to um, to, to help us out. Um, so it, it is a monster logistically, but at the same time, it comes down to good planning. I mean, we know we have our plan for the year. It changes sometimes, but it doesn't change that much. Uh, we know when we're relaying, where we're relaying, and it's because we are we say that the the the, the, the the largest relaying project within the the company definitely we, we we probably get a bit of um you know first dibs as we say for 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 trains and materials and things like that well i was thinking that that a project this size is going to punch a, a, a fair weight yeah uh, and, and you'll be saying oh, hang on a minute your project um important to you as it may be takes second place over my a giant project to Cork. Yeah, exactly. But, but I mean, people do realise that as well. So what we're we're tight in that we have a, a pretty demanding program, whereas um, the, the, there's the other divisions. So Ireland is, set, is is split up into three divisions. So you have the eastern division, you have the southern division, and you have the western division. There's we are relaying between the eastern and the southern division there is relaying that goes on in the other divisions but it's, it's not on the same scale so uh, and there, there, there's probably they've they've more opportunity to move the relaying if they had to so they could move it to a different weekend or something like that but we're, we're tied into our our program but the, the, it is i mean we are relaying every week so um it, it it doesn't be if there's any issues with production they're 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 flagged well in advance so there's I mean we there's production meetings every week um but there doesn't it 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 runs quite well like production department are they're they're, they're very aware of of the program and um and so it's it, it's constantly moving you know it's probably the it's how many trains do you want this week how many trains do you want next next week one of the things that catches out the unwary is percentage return on balance clean. So yeah. you, you're balanced and expecting, say, 75% return. And all of a sudden you go through <laughs> that awkward bit where you're only getting 50, 60% return. You need to do lots more top up. And yeah. all of a sudden you realise you haven't got it in the wagons behind you. Uh, yeah. And what do I do? What do I do? Uh, does that surprise you more than you would like? Or is it something that you're well versed in coping with? We tend to know where those areas would be uh, we tend to know um, the hot spots of, of where we're going to have issues here um, the, the, there was always an issue with bad return because you have to return something so um, we were probably maybe 10 years late starting our ballast cleaning project um, in terms of the, the the life cycle of the ballast um, but it's it's we're, we're we're able to nearly predict where the, where those areas are. What we're not able to predict is where we're running into old sleepers left um, left in the ballast bed, or old benchmarks or bits of terram and things like that. Um, that that that's more of a problem than um, going into areas where okay that we we thought there was ballast there and there's not. Um, I just wondered if you had site sampling where, you know, 
people go out in advance with a, I'll call it a hand riddle, and you sieve test uh, a couple of beds randomly, and you estimate how much you're going to get back from your ballast cleaner, and you either reduce your yardage based on how much clean ballast you're going to have to top up, or you just go for the yardage and accept it's going to be a bit low for a bit. Um, well, we we would have we'll say methods that might be in advance of that. So we do our our clamshells, so we do our trial holds, and then the 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 the, the engineers will go out and inspect these uh, to kind of inform where they go on the night. But uh, the the ballast cleaner would always have the hob strain, so the high output ballast system. Um, so there would it it's not often they're caught shy with ballast because the facility is there to bring in huge amounts of ballast. Um, but it would be more of the case that it would be you, you, you get done what what you can in terms of your output and if it's left low for a while, it's a case that we, we, we'll solve that in the following week because we'll still have the TSR in place. I just wondered if there was a temptation for the ballast cleaner operator to determine that too much is going over the top. Let's put a bit more of the small stuff in behind the cutter bar. Well, I I I hate to say it, but yeah, I think that um that that possibly does happen. I I, I you know, that's that's an honest answer, and thank you for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We did we didn't we're not recording this part of the of the presentation, are we? <laughs> no, no, not at all. No, it's your secrets. <laughs> I think a question from Jim Watson now as well. Was it good, Jim? Yep. Hi, uh, hi, Neil. Hi. A couple of questions regarding your uh, loose sleeper gantry renewals. Mm. Uh, firstly, are you able to operate the Gizmar gantries uh, with single line working in place? No, because because the gantries essentially have to traverse the site and they start on the opposite end of the site from the, the relay train. Uh, and we have tried on starting on this, the, the the nearest the relay train. The, all the, the machines that were removing the, the the panels and the machines that are removing the cleaning out the ballast are working on the opposite road. So it would be there. It would I, I can't see how it would work if we didn't have both roads closed. OK, uh, second question. I'm assuming the loose sleeper beam that you're using is what I would call a jingle jangle beam. It's, it's chains yeah. uh, for each sleeper rather than hydraulic clamps. Yeah. How do you mitigate the issues of working at height using that system? Well, uh, uh, we've our, we've our method statements and our safety files that we, we, we apply those um, those uh, risk controls too, but um, so. But the, the 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 main thing, I suppose, is that everything is stopped when you are hooking on the sleepers. So the guys, the, the guys working on the train, connecting the sleepers, um, they, they are the, the, nothing is moving, and that's that's risk. That 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 risk is controlled from within within our method statements. And then when the when the the, the sleepers are being left on the ground, obviously there's no risk from heights because they're they're not untied until they're on the ground. OK, thank you. Okay, um, we had a question from Stephen Lavery. I think it has pronounced it. I think we've answered already. It was regarding using the DTS and then further down, Stephen says he has to leave now anyway. But excellent presentation now, giving a great insight into a massive project. Great effort all round. Thank you. Yeah, so as I said, we do have a DTS, which we, we, we would hope to move out in the project. I think where I see um, the, 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 the optimum um, use of the DTS would be uh, following the ballast cleaner. So where you have renewed um, the full 300 um, uh, bed of ballast, I mean, we don't tend to have issues. We're not cutting the track, so we don't tend to have those type of issues. Um, and it, we have our tamper there so we can fix any geometry issues so the issue mainly is issues with settlement in the ballast and that's where i would see to increase uh speeds would be following the ballast cleaner would be um that in conjunction with our twin trolley system i think is where we'd like to go i think that's what you need to do tamper regulator dts package yeah. uh three cycles over the top yeah speed walk away 
and yeah. you're on the next site, that's the way to do it. That's in my experience how it should be done. Yeah, well, that 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 is that is what we're looking at. Using new new um, machine on the on the on the network, it has to go through a rigorous um, safety approval. So, um, but it is is something that we're looking at. Yeah, John also have commented um, network rail renewals don't use snake grid as a routine tool. I think it's just a comment, and David said, yeah, but it's just a tool to help establish control on larger projects. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. We we'll have another comment there from Ian Waller. Niall, thank you for a great presentation. Brought back many memories of the entire relaying days. <laughs> I think that's all the questions we've had or we have on the chat. Um, I can open it to the floor for any further questions from anyone if you want to unmute your mics and ask Niall any last questions. Final one for me, if you wouldn't mind, Niall. Um, you mentioned ballast depth minimum 300, but what's your sleeper spacing? And I'm interested in that from a track form point of view. Um, 643. That's pretty accurate. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> 650 would do me. <laughs> yeah, will you, will you be amazed how many times I'm asked that question? <laughs> OK, that, that's, right. that, that's kind of par for the course. Maybe yeah. axle loads, uh, what, what are we talking 25 ton axle loads, that kind of Yeah, yeah, right? yeah, in around that, yeah. Okay. That's me done. Any further questions from anyone at all? Can, can I throw another one in, Neil? I, I know you were predominantly talking tonight about plain line. Uh, Mm. SNC was mentioned just to say out, out of out of interest. Uh, the SNC that you're renewing as part of the project is it uh, on concrete bearers or timber bearers, and is it strengthened or unstrengthened? Um, the, the, so what we've reduced so far, well, there there there, there would be uh, we would have both on the network. So um, as far as the work, there would be we, we possibly would be. Uh, uh, um, repair and um, install them both. So we, what we've done so far, um, there it, it's it's on it's unstrengthened on on um, concrete bearers. So we have done about I think there we we've about thirty units to to replace as we go along the line. I think we've done about um, six at the moment, and the the again I'm I, I I'm not a hundred percent sure on on what we have coming up for next year, but so far they were they were. Um, Timber bearers or concrete bearers. OK, thank you. If we have no further questions from anyone, um, I could just move on to the vote of thanks, Niall. I'll just do that myself. Um, so just wanted to say a really interesting presentation, Niall. It was great you took us through the, the individual processes and explained those as well as describing the actual progress on the project itself. So like you said, the first stage is ballast cleaning, then you took us through ballast cleaning, um, you then moved into the advancements in the survey and you went through all the processes as you went. I liked how you jumped from the project to the, the tasks and, and did a bit, a bit on that as you went. Um, it was great to see the, the use of the whole Trimble suite. Um, it was excellent. It's, it's, also used in Scotland as well from the whole for the whole renewal process from survey to installation and handback. Um, I noted you stated the use of undersleeper pads, which currently over here we, we install under bearer pads for SC, but I don't think on every plane line site we've, we've moved on to undersleeper pads everywhere yet, but I'm sure that's that'll, that'll come. Um, I think as well for a project of that size, 220 miles of renewal it shows how the machines are crucial given that they, you know, the, the quantities that, for example, you said the gantries can lift something like 56 sleepers at once and all that's just going to be crucial to, to getting through such a big task that you have. And great statistics as well in terms of productivity over the years with quite a staggering increase uh, on all your figures there. But you quite rightly balanced that with um, and justified those figures with the all important track quality figures as well. So 
Uh, excellent slides as well. Great to see photographs from the site itself and definitely generated a lot of interest um, in terms of the, the members with questions. So it uh, just remains to say thanks very much, Niall, and I'll ask everyone else to, to join with me and thank you for that presentation. Th thanks very much. So it was great to be asked to, to come on here because um, uh, as part of my job, I'm dealing with with, with uh, my um, colleagues in, in various networks, and I think within the railway industry, it's um, people are really, really willing to help and to share information. So um, again, thanks for having me on. No, thank pleasure having you on now. Yeah, thank you. Just desperate try to find out how to stop the recording so it doesn't. <laughs> I think I can. Just pull it. Angus will stop it. Angus still there, is it? Just yeah, shut down the Zoom call where right? no, it doesn't. Well, probably it doesn't. <laughs> no. It's just in case anyone wanted to continue chatting, but we don't want to record it. So. It's Angus's meeting. He's recording it away. He's done two hours. We'll need to edit this bit, Angus. From here, probably from about half an hour ago when we said we were keeping secrets. <laughs> All we can do is lead. Yeah. Now, so. if you would like to leave the meeting, we will also leave the meeting, and that should shut it down. <laughs> okay. Thanks very much. Nice see you again. Bye-bye. Thanks, Michael. Greg, can you not shut it down? Because I know um, when the three dots button, it says more, the last option at the bottom. Okay.